Let's stick. Some, some, one, two, three. Ah, that, ah, mm. We good? We are good. I don't know if you've noticed, but we built a thing. Are we going to talk about Squoosh again? A little bit. OK. Maybe, maybe. But, but another aspect of Squoosh. So All right. That's, that's kind of interesting. OK. So this, this might be a long one, so bear with me. I'm going to start at where we started, and then we kind of fell down into this rabbit hole. And I want the audience to fall into this rabbit hole with us. With a, yes. And I'm really looking forward to this one, because sometimes when we do these, yeah. One of us is maybe slightly pretending to know maybe. less about the subject than we do. <laughs> uh, whereas in this one, there's a lot that I really don't understand. <laughs> so, And I'm really worried I might not actually be able to explain everything as much as you would like me to. OK. Well, I'll, so I'll, let's see where we end up. Yes, I'll let you know honestly. Let's start with what are images on the web if we manipulate them with JavaScript. So let's talk right. about image data, which is a data structure that we use in Squoosh. So once you get an image in, we decode it, and we turn it into an image data object, which is a data structure that exists on the platform, basically has three properties, a width, a height, and data. Yep. And on data, there is a uint8 clamped array. And in there, you have just four bytes for each pixel. Yes. And they, it's the first row, and the second row, and so on. So and then each one is like red. Green, blue, alpha, right? Exactly. So yeah. what you see here is like it's a red pixel, then a green pixel, and a blue pixel, and a white pixel. And because the image is two by two, that is what the image would look like, right? Oh, nice. So it's cool. basically just a series of numbers with no concept of rows or columns. But because of that information, we can rearrange them and interpret them as a proper two-dimensional image. Brilliant. That's kind of yes. how it works. All right. So now in Squoosh, we had the goal to rotate an image by 90 degrees. Sounds like a simple thing. Probably only take 10 minutes. I mean, you wrote it and the first version, right? And yeah. so um, let's talk about how you wrote it. You wrote it an image by 90 degrees. Gets an input image, which is this image data object. Yes, it is. Um, and what we do, we figure out by 90 degrees what is the new width and the new height, which is pretty much just you know height and width swapped. You're doing fancy SOMA code it's, already. It's a little bit because otherwise it wouldn't fit. So I'm compressing things down. Right. Okay. In this so case, actually, could have two. So here, vectors. you're essentially assigning the height to the width and the width to the height yeah, because, because it's 90 degrees. Right. Okay. I'm following. Right? And right, I'm creating right. a new output image which has this new width and the new height. Yes. So now the goal is to go through the pixels and put them in the right spot in the output ba -ba 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 image. So what we do? We iterate for loop over all the pixels in the input image, and we figure out where they would have to land in the output image. So basically, yep. the new x coordinate is that kind of formula. The new y coordinate is that. And then we figure out which input pixel it is, which output pixel, and just copy it over. More fancy SOMA code here. Know, Wouldn't right? get through review. I know. You don't, <laughs> don't like, like it. it. <laughs> OK, um, but that's And then fine. because we have four bytes per pixel, we just loop over four times and just do the thing, right? Like we copy the r value, the g value, the b value, and the a value. Yep, and off and off we go. And this works. And this was actually decently fast. We shipped it this way. We should say the reason we did this rather than Canvas is yeah. because we wanted to run it in a worker. That's an entire difference. But yes, we, we did yep. a lot of tests with what seemed more fancy fast technology. Didn't seem to work. So we ended up writing yep. our own piece of JavaScript just for this problem. Yes, because off-screen Canvas only in a couple of browsers, whereas this is just basic JavaScript. JavaScript, so that works everywhere. And it can and, run in yeah. a worker because it's yeah. just an image of it. So this, we shipped this. This worked. Yeah. Yes, and then did. I looked at it at some point and was like, hmm, there's actually um, kind of an opti obvious optimization that you missed. And so I, yeah. we basically, uh, I basically added a little patch. Um, this all stays the same, same as before. But now I'm creating a U32 array. Yes. Yes. So what this is, so basically we have the same underlying chunk of memory, but instead of seeing it as a series of bytes, we see it as a series of 32 bits numbers. Because right. every pixel consists of a 32-bit number, right, for R, G, B, and A. And so this way, we can simplify or actually remove the inner loop. So yeah, it's this bit that was here that, that you know, doing something four times every yeah. time, we're now just it's doing now it once. one copy operation, which yeah. actually maps to a machine instruction. Most of the time, so V8 will be like super smart and go like, whoa, fast. So this is actually nice. quite a bit faster. Yes. So cool. And then we ship this, still fine. And then it turns out that for some reason, in one browser, this was super slow. Right. And we've been advised by legal. <laughs> by our legal department to not name the browser. Apparently, it's a Chrome policy not to. Yeah, it, I've never heard that before, but. No, we're not allowed to talk about other browsers, so 
We can't mention which browser it is. But um, it's one that didn't run on machines. It didn't run on your machine, did it? You had no, to use no, a VM no, that's, yeah. to run this different yeah. browser. OK. Either way, like most browsers were fine, good enough at least. And then for some reason, this one browser just ended up being extremely slow, like unreasonably slow even. So we must have hit some weird corner case. Yes. Because I, this browser isn't slow usually. It's a very good browser. Yes, and, and different JavaScript engines optimize for different things. So the fact that one browser was slower here isn't saying that that browser is terrible. It's just saying like V8 is very good with this kind of tight loop code. Yeah. Other engines have optimized for like more DOM binding stuff. Exactly. So it, it wasn't that surprising that one browser was completely different in terms of performance yeah. with this piece of code. So we thought, well, what do we do? Maybe we throw more WebAssembly at the problem, right? Hey. So we uh, looked into that. And the first problem we had that when you write WebAssembly and you load it, it turns into a module that has functions, the functions that you wrote in whatever language you were using. Yes. Right? It's, this is different to a, an ECMAScript module. It's, yeah. it's a WASM module. It's a different yeah. thing. It's yeah. a different thing. And these functions can only take in and return numbers. So yes. there is no easy way straight up to like pass in an image. So what do you do, right? So what, what we ended up doing, and I'm going to reuse the video I made for my article. Oh, brilliant. Basically, the JavaScript is going to load the image, put it into the WebAssembly memory, and then we're going to use WebAssembly to just do the reordering within that WebAssembly memory buffer and use JavaScript to read it back afterwards. Right. So that means the WebAssembly really is completely isolated from all of the outer world, really, so to speak. It just has its chunk of memory to work on. We'll read in the image, do the reordering that we've shown before, and then JavaScript comes back, takes over, and reads back the resulting image. So these the JavaScript and WebAssembly, the thing they share is memory. That they can, Pretty much. Well, it's, it, to WebAssembly, it's its memory. So this WebAssembly.memory is WebAssembly-specific memory, but it is also exposed as an array buffer that we can use as an UN32 array or whatever we need in that very instance. Right? Yeah. So the amount of memory we need for WebAssembly is, is essentially double the size of the image, because it's going to yeah, like, have, have see, the yeah. main image in memory and then the next bit. And done. And okay. Yeah. Um, so, so how do we create WASM? We've done it before with MScript and C, but yeah. there's also Rust. But we actually found a very interesting project we stumbled over called AssemblyScript. Yes. Which is a, they call themselves a TypeScript to WebAssembly compiler, mm -hmm. which is true, but might be a little bit misleading because it is not. You can't just take any TypeScript and compile it to WebAssembly. It is using the TypeScript syntax and the TypeScript standard library things but with their own version of standard library that is specifically tailored to WebAssembly. So what you can see here is the signature where now we have types, as you know from, web, from TypeScript. But there's the i32 type, which is the type that WebAssembly has, but JavaScript doesn't. And that's the 32-bit integer, right? The, yes, the signed 32-bit yes. integer. Signed 32-bit. It's also the okay. u32, which is the unsigned. Why are we using signed? Um, for reasons. For reasons. OK, let's gloss over it. But I, this, this is good, because I, I can recognize this. It looks a lot like JavaScript. Yeah. And it so looks a lot like TypeScript. And so the rest, except for two lines. So this looks the same. You know, we code. switch height and width. Yep. Um, now, this is a bit interesting. Because we have this chunk of memory, mm -hmm. we kind of need to know where our input image starts and where our output image starts. Right. And that's what the, these two variables are. So our input image starts at 0, at address 0 in this memory. Which it always does. Index 0, you could yep. say. And the output image is right after the input image ends. And the input image consists of width times height times 4 bytes. 4 bits per pixel. Bytes. Bytes per pixel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, the thing about this, and I'm sorry to interrupt the flow, is that I should say that I came to the web as a CSS person, CSS yeah. front end, and I learned JavaScript. Whereas you came to the web from being a programmer, well, and then you went to the don't web, say right? I was, I I did embedded systems. Like I was literally writing kernel code and like low-level memory management, and I had no idea about CSS and how to do UI and anything like that. So right. It's just com two completely different angles. But I would say, like, if anyone is watching this thinking, what is going on? It's yeah, like, this is. I am feeling exactly the same. So <laughs> don't don't worry too much about it. Right. Come on. Go, yes, let's, so, let's go. But for now, these are basically just indices in the array. Where does the input yes. image start? Where does the output image start? And then this looks familiar, looping over all the pixels, yep. um, figuring out where the GNU coordinates are. We did all this before. Yep. And yep. now there's these two assembly script specific functions. The first one is load, which allows me to load a U32 from the memory at a given address. Right. And so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using the input image base, the 
where the image starts plus the pixel I want to read. So this is very similar to what we were doing before with the uint32 yeah. array. Um, but we're, but we're, there's but a special because, command to get it straight from memory rather yeah, than. Yeah, because it's a WebAssembly memory, and that's like right. kind of implicit. It's not something that you get handed as, as a reference. It's yes. just there as a global, almost like. But it's the same thing. We're passing the same indice into Ex it. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So we're, yeah. we're loading our pixel, and then all we have to do is like write it back to the output image, and it's the same thing. We're storing the value v, which we just read, mm -hmm. back as a user to into the output image base. OK. And now we have written assembly script. And and this converts to WebAssembly. And what I what really struck me with this is that if I wanted to write WebAssembly, this is the tool I would use. Yeah. Because this looks you really familiar to me. You don't have to learn a new me. language, right? Because yeah. you, you, I think you've learned a bit of C because of Squoosh. Yes. But that's pretty much it, as far as I know. You've not written Rust, I think. Um, you can read I, it. I know PHP. <laughs> is that? I'll read a PHP to a WebAssembly compiler. Then. I, I would love it. That's, that was the first, <laughs> first language I learned. So we have this function now. And now mm -hmm. we want to compile to WebAssembly. And yes. luckily, AssemblyScript makes it very easy. So we just install the AssemblyScript package. And then we have yep. an ASC command, which we give our TypeScript file to, and gives us back a WebAssembly file with no additional glue or JavaScript, which I think is quite interesting, because most other implementations for WebAssembly give you glue code, which yes. you know, is yeah, additional. It's a huge JavaScript file at, at the back. It's really yeah. difficult to deal with and work with. But this is just yeah, just a WASM, right? So we did this. We got our rotate wasm file. And mm -hmm. now the interesting bit might be um, how to load it, because usually glue code loads it for you. But now you don't have glue code. How does this work? It's actually not that difficult. What you do is you take the instantiate streaming function from the WebAssembly object right. and put your fetch in there. Because ah. the WebAssembly compiler, at least the non-optimizing one, can compile while the WASM file is still downloading. So this instantiate streaming takes a promise. A promise or huh. response or an array buffer, or that's a weird API, and it's yeah. like, it's why, would, why does it take a promise? It's, it's because odd, they want to make this simple that you don't have to await the fetch, right? <sighs> okay, don't. I don't agree with it, but that's fine. Sure, you should fine. just put an await in there. But Either way, um, I find it really interesting. Like, it starts compiling while it's still downloading, so so it's not like download, then compile. It's actually almost in parallel, which you know for WebAssembly models which can be quite big. You know, like uh, I think the unit, the Unreal Engine one is like. 40 megabytes, that will make quite a difference. Yes, absolutely. Um, not so much here. So No, absolutely not. So, so yeah, the, the WASM modules, by the way, is like 500 bytes or something. So it's really small. It's all yeah. it's smaller than the compressed and gzip JavaScript code that we had. Nice. So that's actually quite cool. Um, so now we get an instance back from this one. Mm -hmm. And on that instance, we can have exports. And that exports is all the functions, but also the memory that we are going to work on. Right. So we can grow our memory because we don't know what size it has, but it, we have to grow to the size that it fits our images two times, right? Which would have to do calculate. I skipped this year, but I would. Uh, do so that, that would now. just be the, the the size of the image times array two. data yeah. times two. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And then I will somehow load this image into the buffer, which is really just memory has a dot buffer property, which is a normal array buffer. So we can use all the methods you know to put data in there. Right. This to put this. Put it in. Yeah. And then. You call rotate ninety and read the image back, and you're done. Ah, oh, so exports so, have so this, all of the methods. Yeah, so this is the method. This is the magic where you call into WebAssembly, and you can also see it's synchronous. So WebAssembly is something that will actually take the control away from JavaScript and do its thing, and then return the control back to JavaScript. It's just like an actual function. Okay, okay. Which I think is super nice. And so this was fast. We were super happy about this. Yes, this this was much faster than well, it, it, was, it was. It wasn't faster in Chrome. In the sense that, like, it didn't outperform JavaScript. It was as fast, or almost as fast, but it was consistently fast across all browsers. Yes, it was. It had taken the the browser that doesn't run a Mac from seven seconds down to like five hundred or something. Five hundred milliseconds. Something that was yeah. very, very acceptable. It was, it, yeah, it was really nice to see that similar value across all browsers. So we were super happy about this. So we, you know, we opened the PR and our squoosh, and you reviewed it, and we wrote an article, and then. Um, Hacker news happened. Hacker news happened. And that's something I would never say, because usually the comments on our articles are quite um, annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Hacker, Hacker news has a, can sometimes be quite pedantic, I found. Yeah. But in this instance, there was some pedantry, but the pedantry was really interesting. It was really and interesting. Had some fascinating results. And I was 
both just so a lot of it I didn't understand, yeah. and I hope you're going to explain it to me. Yeah, so someone now. said, uh, why aren't they using tiling? Tiling would make this so much faster. Let me quickly try it. Yeah, I totally did this in like 20 milliseconds. I was like, what? Yeah. So I they, sat down. So, so they, they had taken it from, what, what was it, sort of 300, 400 milliseconds yeah. down to, what was it? I think 40. 40, which is it's such Mind a blowing. huge improvement. And, and that's even faster than we were seeing from a canvas yeah. element. Like, it's, yeah. So and I had to like obviously sit down and actually understand what was happening. So let's talk about what tiling actually is. Yes, please do, because I have no idea. <laughs> so I'm going to explain tiling. But there was also another suggestion for performance optimization. I'm going to talk about both of these. But I'm going to talk okay. about the other one first, because to get it out of the way. Basically, all right, all right. some people were saying, oh, if you look at this y times width, it's completely independent of the inner loop. So if I move it out between the outer and the inner loop, I would make it faster because that calculation can happen only once per outer loop. It doesn't need to happen every time in the inner loop. Yes, and I thought this was going to be the kind of thing that the optimizer thingy doodah would take care of for me. And it is. So this ah. is exactly the kind of advice where you don't have to worry about these kind of things. Where, like moving constants out of a loop is something that not only most compilers can do, so like the assembly compiler could do this or the Rust compiler, but even the V8 Com compiler from that go from the JavaScript to machine code or from WebAssembly bytecode to machine code will do this. Mm -hmm. So this is an optimization that we don't have to do and where we can say, you know, let's keep it readable and obvious and don't introduce another variable where people that read the code would have to have even more state in their head to understand what's going on. Yes. OK. But the other thing is tiling. And tiling is something that I hadn't heard of. I actually had heard of it. But I also was under the impression that compilers would do it for us. And in this case, it is not. What is it? So Show what is me. tiling? So this is an image. Uh, it's actually the album cover of our podcast. I don't know. Did you know that we do a podcast, we Jake? We do a podcast as well. We should link to it in the description, Jake. Yes, we should. <laughs> so we have been reading this image so far like this. We've been going row by row yep. and just, you know, what is this pixel? Where does it belong? OK, copy. And look at the next pixel in the same row. That's kind of what we did. And we thought, fine. Tiling is a different approach where you tile the image into tiles. That's good. Yeah, those are tiles. Excellent. Um, and then do whatever you're trying to do within a tile first. So instead of going row by row, you just go tile by tile. And within the tile, you go row by row. This, this is legitimately. It's the same thing. This is legitimately a different way of doing the same thing. I know. Now, the interesting thing is that this turned out to be so much faster. Yeah, and like a tenth of the time. I still don't understand yet. So let's implement this real quick, which because it's not actually. Can I, can I just say, like, one of our previous recent episodes, we talk about the dangers of over optimization. Yeah. And when. We, wh why are we doing this? Because it ends up being so much faster. OK, 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 OK. We, we actually, met, with this optimization, we end up going well below 100 milliseconds, which within the rail guidelines makes it feel like an instantaneous response to the button. It, it is an optimization. And that before matters. that, cool. we were at like 300 to 500, which was fine. But you know, if we can go under 100, we should go under 100. Especially for bigger images. OK. Yeah. So basically, I just do an additional two outer loops, which usually sounds wrong, but in this case is very, very right, where we iterate over all the tiles that we have. And then in there, we basically have the same old loop where we loop over each individual tile. I'm starting to hyperventilate. I, I, why? OK. I, so this is tiling implemented. So I get it. And let's and talk I, about why this might things make things faster. OK, that is the bit I don't understand. So originally tiling, whenever you when I Google tiling and research it, it was mostly the use case for matrix multiplication, which is a different okay. use case because input values are used multiple times. So right, if you, if, you, if you multiply two matrices, you have to read the cell at 1, 1 multiple times for, I think, for each column that you're calculating the output matrix. Okay. So it makes sense that if you do tiling, you have a better chance of having that value still in the cache. We're talking now. Processor level one cache, by the way. So, so hang on. Like, okay, we will need to explain what that is at some point <laughs> as well. But like, my my feeling is by reading memory sequentially, you're more likely to hit caches because you're talking, you're dealing with a little bit of memory that is very close to the last bit of memory. Yeah, but that so so if I have these two really big matrices and I go through the first row of the input matrix, by the time I come at, I end up at the end. 
the values from the start might have been kicked out the cache, because level one cache in the processor is really small. We're talking like 200 kilobytes of cache, maybe, or right. less. So the, the, the processor has like an L1 cache, an L2 Which is like, like super fast. So the, there's, there's these set of caches that yeah. get bigger and slower yeah. until you get to memory. So actually, memory is actually really slow. Memory is really slow in relative terms. Yeah. yeah. OK. And so what the tiling does is by shortening the amount of time you spend going away from your initial value, you have better chance of having the initial value still in your level. For matrix multiplication. So with uh, this one, yeah, this it is didn't not make that. sense why this would make it because, faster. Because the, the second row is a massive jump yeah, so from the first. For the rotation, we read every value once, and we write it once. So why would caching make things better? That is, that is roughly the question I have in my head. So there's two theories, and I don't know what of, which one of them is actually true. Why are you telling me you don't even know? <laughs> Well, I even talked to Benedict, our VA VM engineer, and okay. he's like, I have two theories, but it's really hard to test. Um, OK. So okay. You know, one version is that lots of processors nowadays are really smart at predicting what memory you are going to grab next. So by basically seeing the tiles, it can make better predictions what um, oh. cells to grab already put into the cache for you, even though you haven't executed that code yet. And the other thing is, that because the cache is so small that there's a certain pattern which cell can be cached in which cache cell. So this gets a little bit confusing. But basically, if you think about it, you if you have like three cache cells, just three individual cells. What, what, what can go in a cell? Like one value. One value, OK, OK. Um, you say, OK, so memory address 0 can only go in cache cell 0. Address yep. 1 can go in cache cell 1. Cache 2 can go in cache cell 2. Memory address 3 can only go in 0 again. You wrap around, right? So you, yeah, you, yeah, you okay. assign those. Yep. And then again, by keeping it smaller, you have a better chance of not overwriting the old value that you have put in into your level 1 cache. So basically, all this is about is by making things, making your access memory smaller so that you don't evict the cache from the things that you. Well, so, so this is basically it's working because our inner loops are smaller. Yeah. Right. And so it makes better, so it makes the processor make better predictions and also make the processor not evict the cache because the area we work on is smaller. So then does the tile size, um, yeah, what's the tile size? So that's okay. what I thought, right? Okay. And so I did some benchmarks on a MacBook, <laughs> on an iMac, and a Pixel 3. Because the yep. bigger the machine, or the, the bigger the processor, the bigger the level one cache usually is. Right. So the iMac that I have is like an 18 core Massive Stupid processor thing. It has massive L1. While the Pixel 3 obviously has a very, very tiny level 1 cache. All, all this code is single core anyway, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, at zero is the relative time it took for no tiling. So, so that's that's the original that's piece of code. That's our baseline time. The WASM, yes. So what you can see here is how the time shifted relatively to that base time depending on what the tile size is. Interesting. So if I have a tile size of 2, a 2 by 2 pixel grid, it makes the code slower, which is not very surprising because you have so much more looping going on and more yep. jumps. OK. It gets faster really, really quickly. At some point, over here, you kind of hit level 1 cache boundaries where it then gets slower again. Right. I see. OK. To be honest, there's one weird thing where the Pixel 3 is slow even with a massive grid, which fast. I'm not quite sure why that is. I think actually. You mean it's fast even? Yeah. It's, it's fast. I, I expect the Pixel 3 to like, go up somewhere around here. You would assume the level one cache is less than yeah. any MacBook? It probably and is, Mac. and there's probably other effects that I don't quite understand. OK. But what I found really interesting. architecture as well yeah. in that processor. But okay. it seems to be a sweet spot between like 16 and, I don't know, 64, depending on what you want. I'm actually, I think 16 looks really promising in this graph, which means you have like a 256 pixel grid that you work with. I thought I was going to come into this episode, and I was going to Go away, understanding why the no. tiling works. No, it just does. It's 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 this uh. is as much as I spent the last week on this, right? right. Like you've been kind of sitting across me and hearing me talking to people and trying to figure this out. This is as close I've gotten to understand it, in that there is this interaction between the processor predicting what values were in the cache and then not forcing the processor to evict that cache because you read too far ahead. 
But this is a massive case for tools, not rules, right? Like, don't yeah. don't go away and rewrite all your code with tiling. Just with tiling, small. no. You, like, this is something you would have to very carefully profile on a, a, a wide range of machines with yeah. different processor architectures to see is this actually working and across. And it's also the... I found it interesting because we started at let's rotate an image, a very high level use case, and we fell down and ended up with like let's talk about processor architecture and level <laughs> one caches. Yes. Um, so thanks to Hacker News, I guess, for ruining my week. But it's been actually been very educational, I, even though I still don't fully understand it. But I feel and like, I'm okay with that. Yeah, and I feel like my <laughs> understanding of, of lower level stuff is, like I said, there's that confusion element. But I feel like I've got an appreciation for like the smarts, right? That, yeah, that go into that. It's it, it's it's incredible. So let's let's take a breather. I and we'll see our our, our poor poor audience next time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is but this is going into Squish and it, yeah, it's going to be shipped. Works. It's going to be shipped. Brilliant. Yes. Oh, that's one thing. I've, ah. Mm. I why did I have to write this down? Um, how do I fix this? <laughs> Something uh, for the edit. Something for, for the, the edit. edit. Okay, let's go from here. <laughs>